Hey there, Wastelanders, and welcome back to War Games News Radio for another installment of Better Know a Faction, a series where I break down the different special rules and tactics for factions in Fallout Wasteland Warfare. In this episode, we're taking a look at another one of the new factions in the Commonwealth expansion wave, the Railroad. Made up of covert operatives across the Commonwealth, the Capital Wasteland, and beyond, the Railroad are an underground movement dedicated to liberating sentient synths from their creators at the Mysterious and Nefarious Institute. In Wasteland Warfare, the Railroad make use of named characters and a wide array of special abilities to help them turn the tide of battle in their favor. So let's take a look at the Railroad Faction's special rules and break down all of their special units, strengths, and weaknesses. The Railroad have access to three different Faction special rules. First up, if your Faction contains only Railroad units, then during game setup you may secretly look at up to any three searchable markers on the battlefield that are more than one Black Range Ruler length away from your deployment zone. This can help you figure out which markers you may want to interact with to try and gain some extra loot, and which markers you may want to avoid. For their second rule, all units with the Railroad Faction keyword have a specialty when using their signature weapon, the Railway Rifle. A weapon specialty means you gain a plus two to hit when using that particular weapon, and this buff can significantly increase the combat effectiveness of your Railroad units. Now the Railway Rifle has a number of special abilities that make it a pretty diverse weapon. With a range of two blue rulers, it has a pretty decent range and grants a yellow armor break die at long range and a special blue effect die at short range. That blue special effect die makes all the difference with this weapon, so when possible, try to use it at close range. The Railway Rifle deals two base damage, but it adds one extra point of damage for every Nuka-Cola bottle that you roll when making an attack, one armor break for every star you roll, and a stun when rolling a mushroom. Cloud. All of these effects can stack on top of each other, and unlike some weapons, there's no cap on how many times you can apply each of these bonuses for every attack. This means that at close range, you're guaranteed to activate at least one of these buffs on every attack because of that blue die, while at long range, there's only a 1 in 12 chance that you're going to roll a bottle and deal an extra point of damage. One other thing to note on this faction-wide railway rifle specialty is that as of the filming of this video, nearly half of the railroad models currently available can't use rifles at all. So when building your railroad lists, it's best to keep in mind that this rule doesn't actually impact all railroad units equally. Last up for faction rules, railroad units can never be included in a force that also contains units with the Institute faction keyword on their card. This restriction fits with their Fallout 4 lore, and it's more thematic than anything, but it does rule out any quirky railroad institute roster combos like adding Kellogg or a Courser to your railroad force. Taking a look at the Railroad Faction's battle mode roster for a moment here, their options are even more limited because as of the filming of this video, only units with the Railroad keyword can be included in a Railroad Faction list. And interestingly enough, not even units like the Soul Survivor variants are on their battle mode list, which to me doesn't make a ton of sense, honestly, given that the Railroad are one of the playable factions in Fallout 4 and arguably one of the only altruistic good guys in the franchise. So it's possible that down the line we may see a change to the Railroad faction battle mode roster list, at the very least to include some units from the survivors, but time will tell on that one. Keen-eyed viewers will also notice that according to this battle mode roster, no railroad models have access to any sort of power armor. Now keep in mind that this limitation only applies to this specific game mode, so when playing narrative or settlement mode, feel free to go nuts with the T-51s and X-01s. As a quick aside while we're on the subject of power armor, I'm not going to make any recommendations in this railroad faction breakdown for any power armor suits, and not just because their battle mode list doesn't include any options for it. I get a surprising amount of power armor recommendations recommendation requests every time I make one of these videos, but honestly, if I did a recommendation for every unit and set of power armor in every faction video, these would be like an hour long. Now I am working on a power armor specific review coming very soon, so in the meantime, check out my Brotherhood of Steel, Enclave, and Raider faction reviews if you want to get a breakdown on most of the armors available in the game. With all the faction rules out of the way, let's take a look at all the railroad units and their strengths and weaknesses. Starting things off is the Railroad Heavy, the only non-unique unit on the railroad list. Despite not being able to use thrown weapons or pistols, heavies are arguably the most well-rounded combat unit in this faction, hitting with melee weapons and rifles on sixes. And because of the faction specialty, that perception of six goes up to an eight when using the railway rifle. They're also one of the few units in the faction that can use big guns, despite not being very consistent with them, hitting on an agility of just four. 
Heavies are pretty tanky despite having only five hit points, and that's thanks to their three physical and two plus one strong energy armor. As far as objective skills go, heavies are decidedly lacking with no hacking abilities and an intelligence of four for search tests and a luck of two when lock picking. So best to leave the objective running to other units and let the heavies focus on combat. Now they are by no means a cheap unit at 83 caps as of their release, and they get even more expensive when using the railway rifle for another 20. But if you've got the room on your roster, they're a dedicated combat unit worth every cap. Throw a long barrel mod onto that railway rifle and they become an accurate sniper with a chance to deal damage and special effects at double black range. Moving on to the faction's unique units, which is honestly most of them, we have Drummer Boy, one of the railroad's messengers. With a movement of red and a charge range of green, Drummer Boy is one of the fastest units in the faction. He ignores difficult terrain and has access to move and charge quick actions, and he's one of the harder units in the faction to hit because of his zigzag rule, which adds one piece of cover when targeting Drummer Boy with a ranged attack. Now, Drummer Boy is far from the faction's best combat unit, hitting with pistols on a perception of four and melee weapons with a strength of three. And he's one of four railroad characters that can't use rifles at all, so that railway rifle faction specialty is completely wasted on this unit. He is a half-decent objective runner in the right circumstances, searching on sevens, lockpicking on fives, and hacking on a luck of just three, and using a chem like Spark or XL will only make him more effective. But Drummer Boy does make for an interesting tactical wild card because of his new Orders ability. Once per activation, Drummer Boy can transfer a ready token from one friendly model to another if they are both within his red presence range. This can let you make a quick tactical adjustment to what units you activate in a round, but it only works if you have at least two units within six inches of Drummer Boy, one with a ready token and one without. Speaking of tactically minded units, next we have PAM, which stands for Predictive Analytic Machine. This pre-war AI is housed within the body of an Assaultron, and she was designed to foresee future events, and this is reflected in her predictive special rule. If PAM is unready when a non-friendly unit is activated within her awareness range of double black, PAM can get the jump on that unit by becoming ready and activating before the opposing model, allowing you to interrupt your opponent's turn. Like Drummer Boy, Pam has an impressive move range of red and a charge of green. She's also immune to battle cry and has access to move and charge quick actions. As for weapons, Pam is equipped with the Assaultron swipe free of charge, and while she isn't the most effective combat unit with no ranged abilities and hitting with melee weapons on an agility of just four, Pam does have a strength of seven which grants an extra black die when making melee attacks. She is one tough customer with eight hit points, immunity to radiation damage, and two plus one strong physical and energy resistance, making her one of the tankiest units in the entire faction. With an intelligence of nine, Pam is the best hacker in the railroad, and she also searches on a decent perception of six, but she's by no means a cheap unit coming in at 90 caps, so I'm curious to see how much Pam will actually get in railroad lists going down the road. Moving on to one of the more versatile units in the railroad, we have Tinker Tom, who is my personal favorite of this faction. At just 56 caps as of the filming of this video, Tinker Tom is a steal of a deal. He's the railroad's most balanced objective runner, hacking and lockpicking on an intelligence of eight, and he searches on a luck of four. He can't be locked out of any terminals because of his genius special rule, and his Tinkerer Aura ability lets him and any friendly models in his green presence range add an extra accuracy die when making any lockpick or hacking tests. On top of all that objective goodness, Tom is a half decent range combat unit, hitting with pistols and rifles on a perception of five, and that range stat goes up to a seven when using the railway rifle due to the faction specialty. So for the cost, I'll be giving Tom this weapon nine times out of 10 to take advantage of all those bonuses. His other combat skills though, aren't anything to write home about, hitting on melee with threes, throwing weapon on twos, and no big gun skill at all. Tinker Tom also has access to use expertise quick actions and can use luck points, which is always a handy ability. For more on luck, see page 52 in the core rulebook. The modder ability only adds to Tinker Tom's value and versatility, allowing you to draw three mod cards and keep two during game setup, which can then be equipped to friendly unmodded weapons. But with six hit points, two physical and one energy armor, Tinker Tom is a bit on the squishy side. So some extra armor buffs like the armored pads or sturdy metal armor will go a long way towards upping Tom's survivability. Next up, we have Mr. Tims, one of the railroad's safe house leaders. Another cheap unit at 60 caps, Mr. Tims is affordable and has a decent blend of combat and objective skills. But like Drummer Boy, he can't use rifles, so he also doesn't benefit from the faction specialty, but he does hit with pistols on a decent agility of six and melee weapons with a slightly less decent strength of four. 
He also has access to pistol quick attack actions, which can come in handy in a pinch, and he has an okay spread of hacking and searching skills, hitting on sixes and fives respectively. Mr. Tim's standard AI card loadout equips him with a 44 revolver, but if it were me, I'd give him something like the 357 or 44 Magnum, which have a wider spread of effect dice for just a few caps extra. The hunting revolver is also a cost-effective pistol choice for Mr. Tim's because of its long black range and two green accuracy die and a chance to stun enemy models. Speaking of stuns, Mr. Tim's rousing special rule lets him remove a stun token from models within his presence range of blue. Now the way this rule is written leaves a little bit up to the imagination because the card doesn't actually specify when this ability can or should be activated and whether or not it applies to friendly, neutral, unfriendly, or all of the above type models. But I went ahead and reached out to the developers of Wasteland Warfare on the rules forum and Dominic from the Modifius team has confirmed that rousing can be used only once per activation and only on friendly models. If you ever run into an issue like this, the rules forum is a great place to get an official answer from Modifius, and you can always ask the helpful Wastelanders over on our WGNR Discord channel. Check out links to both the forum and our server in the description below. Mr. Timms also has the close quarters special rule, which lets him ignore the minus two penalty when using a ranged weapon in close combat. But keep in mind that this rule doesn't remove the extra point of armor that your opponent gets when they are the target of this kind of attack. So prepare accordingly with a weapon that grants a black or yellow die to help punch through that extra armor at close range. Not unlike Tinker Tom, Mr. Tim's isn't the tankiest unit out there with six hit points and two physical and energy resistance, so extra armor might be a wise investment. Speaking of wise investments, if you like what you see here on the channel, then hit that like button, subscribe, and consider heading on over to our Patreon page. How's that for a segue? Starting at just three bucks a month, you can help support the channel and get some kickbacks like double entry into WGNR giveaways, access to polls that help decide the content here on the channel, and even become a named character in a future live stream or battle report. And that three bucks, it's three bucks Canadian. So that's like, what, 12 cents American? If monthly subscriptions aren't in your budget, we totally understand. We are a pretty shoestring budget operation here as well. But you can also check out our merch store where you can get hoodies, t-shirts, crafting aprons, paint mugs, so you can help support the channel and look good doing it. But that's enough shameless self-promotion. Let's get back to the railroad. Shifting back to combat units, Glory is a liberated Gen 3 synth and one of the railroad's toughest units. Her health stats are similar to the Railroad Heavy, with 6 hit points, 3 physical and 2 plus 1 strong energy armor, and 1 radiation resistance. Glory is by far the best big gunner in the faction with a strength of 7. She also outranks a lot of other Railroad units when using thrown weapons and in close combat, hitting on a perception of 5. That strength of 7 adds a black die when Glory makes melee attacks, but she's below average with pistols and rifles, hitting on an agility of just 3. Even with the Faction Railway Rifle specialty, Glory is pretty much below average when it comes to rifles, so best to lean on her strong suits and focus on melee weapons and big guns, especially because of her quick reload ability. Once per round, Glory can flip for luck, and if she's successful, she can get a second shot with a slow-firing big gun. She's resistant to battle cry, and because she's a synth, her reluctant ability unfortunately gives her a minus two to attack rolls against other synths. So keep in mind that if you're going up against the Institute, this last rule only applies to early model synths like Gen 1s and Patrollers, not advanced Gen 3 synths, namely Coursers. Next up is Deacon, the Railroad's Master of Disguise. With a perception of six, Deacon is in a three-way tie as the best rifleman in the entire faction. He has two specialties, the Railway Rifle Faction Specialty and a specialty with the Hunting Rifle. He also receives the Huntsman perk for free, which allows Deacon to replace the basic damage of any rifle shot with the special one damage shot that adds a blue effect die, which can add a broken leg when rolling a star. Now this ability has to be declared before making an attack skill roll, and it can't be used with weapons that deal radiation damage. The careful special rule ensures that Deacon always hits his intended target when shooting into close combat, and he has access to attack quick actions. As far as objective skills go, Deacon is subpar when hacking or lockpicking with a skill of just two, but he's not bad at search tests with a perception of six. Now Deacon doesn't have pistol or big gun skills, but his melee and thrown weapon abilities aren't terrible by railroad standards at least, with the strength of five and an agility of four. 
When it comes to battlefield triage, Doc Carrington is the railroad's dedicated medic unit. Hitting on threes with pistols, melee attacks, and thrown weapons, the good doctor is arguably the least effective combat unit in the railroad faction. But he makes up for these shortcomings with his battle medic ability, allowing Carrington to remove one damage, stun, freezing effect, broken arm, or broken leg from a friendly unit within line of sight and yellow range once per activation. Just keep in mind that this rule can't be used on robots, creatures, or power armor. Carrington has a move range of red, which is better than average, but his charge range is actually shorter than his standard move at just yellow. And if I'm not mistaken, this makes him one of only two units currently available in the game that has a charge range that's shorter than their standard move, which I guess is the developer's way of reflecting that close combat is really not the Doctor's strong suit. Despite having no lockpick skills, Carrington is a decent objective runner when it comes to hacking and searching because of his intelligence of seven, and he has access to use expertise quick actions. But he is the squishiest unit in the railroad with just five hit points, two physical armor, and one energy resistance. So it's not a bad idea to partner him up with units like the Railroad Heavy, Glory, or Deacon, just in case. Lastly, we have Desdemona, the fearless leader of the railroad who is locked and loaded with special rules that help buff the rest of your railroad force. Hitting on fives with melee weapons, fours with big guns, and sixes with pistols and rifles, Desdemona is one of the few all-rounder combat units in this faction. And of course, that rifle skill can get bumped up to an eight when using the railway rifle because of the faction specialty. She can help secure some objectives in a pinch, hacking and searching on her intelligence of six, and lockpicking on a low luck of three. But where Desdemona really shines is in her aura abilities. Her morale special rule gives all other friendly models in line of sight and within her black presence range an extra hit point, and her motivating rule dishes out a modified VATS roll to herself and all friendly units in that same black range, gaining an additional action point when rolling a mushroom cloud, which equals a one in six chance to gain some extra action points. Like Doc Carrington, Desdemona has a move range of red and a shorter charge range of yellow. Again, this might be counterintuitive, but it's kind of interesting to see the game designers flipping the script when it comes to moves and charges with these two units, and I'm curious to see if this is a trend we'll see going forward with more factions. Desdemona also has access to move and charge quick actions, and she can bank critical points. All these buffs combined with her auras give her a handful of abilities that almost mimic a heroic unit without spending the 60 caps on that heroic upgrade. But that doesn't mean that Desdemona is cheap by any stretch, as she's the most expensive unit in the faction at 108 caps before equipment. She's also one of the toughest units in the faction with seven hit points, three physical, two energy, and one radiation resistance. There you have it, Wastelanders, the railroad broken down from start to finish. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you're having fun playing with these new Commonwealth factions. I know I'm having a blast getting these out on the tabletop, and we have some Commonwealth-themed battle reports coming for you folks very, very soon. There's only one faction left in this expansion that we haven't covered, and they're going to be coming out in June, and that's the Children of Adam. It's the faction that I'm personally most excited for in this expansion, so we're going to have a faction review for them coming very, very soon. In the meantime, you can and check out the Gunners Faction review popping up here, and we've got lots more content coming for you every single week. So thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned, because as always, WGNR will be back.